This month, Q&A expands to two programs each weekend to present a series of interviews from London looking at the new British coalition government, its program of planned cuts to a variety of government programs, and to compare it to what is happening in the United States. Our next guest is Matthew Paris, a columnist for the Times of London. He also has a weekly radio program on the BBC. Mr. Paris was a Conservative Party member of the House of Commons from 1979 to 1986. Our interviews were recorded in the studios of Westminster Live, located across the Thames River from the Houses of Parliament. Matthew Paris, back in April of 2010, you wrote, The truth is simple. We're living beyond our means. The change, if change were what we were really prepared to embrace, is simple. We will have to live within our means. That was several months ago. Yeah, and it's something not just I, but a uh, great many commentators have been saying since at least the early years of, of this century. All of us in Britain, nearly all of us, have had an impression of a prosperity, a growing uh, prosperity, which appeared to be beyond any explanation in terms of anything that we were producing or exporting. And when people have said, I can't believe, we, why are we getting so much richer? Why are our houses uh, worth so much more? The reply from um, the clever economists has tended to be, ah, it's all to do with financial services, the city. We don't need to make things anymore. You know, the added value is taking place in China. I've never been convinced by this. And over the last uh, more than a decade, actually, over the last 15 years or so, I've had the impression that we were just bidding up the value of each other's houses because property and property values are absolutely the cornerstone of the Englishman's idea of wealth bidding up the value of each other's houses, then taking out bank loans on the inflated values, and, and then on the basis of the bank loan, buying more expensive properties, helping bid up the price of property, um, and then borrowing on, on the back of it. And it couldn't, it couldn't last, and, and it didn't. I'm not an expert economist, so all I can say is that I had the feeling that something was rotten, but I couldn't really put my finger on what. It's becoming a little clearer what now. Well, back in 2005, you wrote a column in the uh, Times of London, and let me read this. I think it's about half past four. For America, 2005, Iraq. Think of Britain, 1899, Boer War. Ever heavier burdens are being loaded upon a nation whose economic legs are growing shaky, whose hegemony is being taunted, and whose sense of world mission may be faltering. Overcommitted question mark, is the whisper. That's five years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And that was a column uh, as much about the United States as, uh, as about Britain. But I, I have a, a, a very strong sense that we reached the apparent peak of our imperial power quite a long time after the basis in terms of economic strength and in terms of military strength, the, the basis of that peak had begun to fade. And so there's a sort of overhang in a way. And you know, Britain on the map, uh, Brit the British Empire was it at its largest in the 1930s. But, but you could see by then that there was no way that we could maintain all this. We were becoming top heavy. And um, a, a period of reckoning, which has really comprised most of the last century and continues, was to follow. Uh, I have the feeling that the same thing will be true of the United States. Uh, open question. What do you do for a living? <laughs> yeah, uh, no one ever quite asks that, and I'm always stumped <laughs> when people do. I tell people I'm a writer and broadcaster. I like to say journalist because people know what the term means, but the truth is a columnist is not a journalist. I think a journalist is a reporter. Those are the people I admire. I admire the people that go out with tape recorders and notebooks and learn shorthand and come back with true accounts of what they've seen. That's what I call journalism. Anybody can sit back in their office and pen a few thoughts on their opinions on the way the world is going. That's what I do. So I am paid to do what lots of British people do on the top deck of a bus, offer my opinions on things. And that's not a real job, as my father used often enough to remind me. How long have you lived in uh, uh, the United Kingdom? Well, I'm really a colonial boy. I was, I was born 
in South Africa. My parents emigrated, uh, intending to emigrate permanently to South Africa after the Second World War. They couldn't find a home in England. They didn't like the apartheid, uh, the, 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 the racial stuff in South Africa. They came back, but they came back with me. Uh, then they found England too cold after South Africa, and they went to Cyprus, and then they went to uh, southern Rhodesia, where I was mostly raised. And then I went to school in Swaziland, and then my family were posted to Jamaica, and then to Spain. So at the age of 18, I come back to England as a young man to go to university, who talks, as I talk now, with a very British accent, but who doesn't really un understand or know the United Kingdom very well. I feel completely British, because I belong to a generation uh, for whom serving in the old empire was an entirely British thing to do. So I feel entirely British, but I didn't know England very well, and I've been learning ever since. When did you serve in Parliament as a member of the House of Commons? I was elected, I think the third youngest in, in that intake, at the age of 29 uh, in 1979, and I served for seven years. Uh, before resigning my seat between elections in, in order to take a job in television, doing very much what you're doing now. But not so well, I may say. I, 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 that job bombed. Why did it bomb? I, in British television, I think it's true in America too, you need to be a little bit larger than life. You need to be a bit colourful, a bit of a comic book character to succeed. And all those people whom anybody has heard of in British television answer that description. They may be bright, I was bright enough. They may be articulate. I'm articulate enough. But there's also something memorable, cartoonable about them. And I led my program to an early grave. Well, let me just ask this simple question. Larry King has been on our television uh, screens for years and years, and he's about to retire to be replaced by a man named Piers Morgan. Mm. Of course, that's what Piers is, is going to do. Well, I, I, Piers absolutely answers the profile I've just given of the person who succeeds in television. Piers is a secretly sensitive, a secretly intelligent man, but he pretends to be a bit of a loudmouth, and he says all kinds of things that sound sometimes blundering and sound careless of whether he offends or not. And people love it. Yeah, but you, you've got, there's got to be intelligence behind the apparent stupidity. And, and that, that's, for a popular TV presenter, that's what you want. You need the facade of stupidity so people feel they can relate to you. But underneath it, you need intelligence. And Piers has that. So what do we expect to see when he comes on the, the former Larry King show next year? It'll, it'll be a mixture. Um, he, he likes to get people um, talking about themselves and being a little bit emotional. Uh, I wouldn't call it Oprah Winfrey, but it's that sort of, uh, that sort of area. He, he, he got our Prime Minister Gordon Brown to cry a, a little while ago, our former Prime Minister. But, but he also likes to surprise and ambush people with questions that they are not expecting. And he's not afraid to go personal, deeply personal. So when you were in uh, House of Commons, what did you take away from there? What did you learn about the way, and it's right, the Houses of Parliament are right behind you, uh, what did you learn about that institution? I never entirely found my feet there. I, I failed at a lot of jobs in my life, and I, I would say that was, uh, that was one of them. What I learned about the House of Commons is, is firstly, that it, it's, it's a team game. There is a place for maverick individuals, one or two, but only one or two. Generally speaking, you get on well personally, you advance your own career, and you also achieve things politically and nationally as part of a team. If you don't have the idea of teamwork, if you don't have the idea of occasionally biting your lip, uh, swallowing your own scruples, if you don't have the idea of uh, turning a blind eye to a little dirty dealing from time to time, then, then you don't prosper. I think the other thing I learnt is, and I don't from my exposure to American politics think that your own politics are all that different, is that it's a mistake to think that politics is about, primarily, about principle and about argument. Principle is, is never entirely absent. Argument is important. Rationality, uh, when flouted uh, too obviously and for too long, will always cause you difficulties. But in the end, 
in politics in Britain, you are representing an interest. Um, and there are a group of people um, whose interests you are representing. And if it's the Conservative Party, you may care because you're a compassionate Christian or whatever uh, for the poor. But the poor is not the interest whom you are representing. You're rep representing the lower middle classes, the middle classes, much of the upper classes. And never, never forget that. Y you can flout them a little bit. You, you can uh, tweak them a little bit. But if in the end they feel you're, their, you're not their man uh, any longer, then you're done for. And I, 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 that may sound a cynical view, but there, there is actually a, a, a principled defence of this kind of politics. As long as our House of Commons, and to some degree our House of Lords, has representatives of all interests within it, then fine, let them clash. Uh, let, let, let the best argument win. Let the, the strongest group, the largest number, win. You are an advocate like an advocate in court. You don't always think that your client is innocent. You don't always think that your client's argument is very strong, but you make the best of that argument that you can, and you leave it to other advocates for other groups to make the competing argument, and you let the process decide. There is a principled argument for doing politics like that, rather than everybody just bleating about their own consciences all the time. This is a frivolous uh, thing I want to ask you about, or maybe you don't think it's so frivolous. Some time ago, and I guess this year, you jumped in this water out here, the Thames, <laughs> yeah. and swam across it. When did you do that? Why did you do it? And how old are you? I did that on the 28th of February, 1978. So I will have been 27 or 28 at the time. It was, as you say, just down there on this side of the river. Uh, there is a building that used to be the local government headquarters of London. I was working for Margaret Thatcher. Uh, as her correspondence clerk. It was about 10 o'clock at night. I'd been working late. I saw a little boy and girl. I was across the river and walked to Waterloo Station, which is just nearby, to take a train home. Saw a little boy and girl standing by the parapet and crying. And I thought they're out late. I asked them what was wrong. They said, we took our dog out for a walk before bed. It's clambered onto the stone parapet, which is only yay high. It's not, not a high parapet. And it's fallen in the water. And because it's high tide, it can't find the steps there underneath the water. And it was high tide and it was dark, it was winter, it was w waves, it was windy. And I saw a little head of a dog going round and round in circles. Now, this was not courage, it was stupidity. I was born in Africa. I've always swum in African rivers. I had no idea an English river was so cold in winter. I just threw off my suit and jumped in. I damn nearly drowned. But uh, just as my strength began to depart my body after about three minutes in the water, I had got close enough to the steps for hands to reach out to pull me and the dog out. And Margaret Thatcher gave me a, an award, an RS Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Award for bravery a couple of months later. And without that award and without the publicity that surrounded it, I would never have been selected as a Conservative candidate for a, a safe Tory seat. But then you swam the river this ah. year. Now, this is at the age of 61. Uh, this was earlier this year, during the summer. That river has always had a sort of strange allure for me. I guess my, my career was founded on it. And uh, I have a flat, an apartment on, on the river, looking across. It's uh, wider than it is here, further down. And ever since I moved in 15 years ago, I've said I'm going to swim across that river. You can't live by the side of a river and never have swum to the other side. Uh, so I thought I would, and I kept telling people I would, and it became a joke among my friends. Oh, yes, he's going to swim the river. After 15 years of saying I would, one evening I suddenly thought, now is the night. I waited for what I thought was high tide. I looked at the tide tables on the internet. I didn't realise that um, high tides, all navigational information is given, obviously, in Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, this was British summer time. I got the time of the tide wrong, so, of course, you want, to, you want to swim at slack tide when the tide is turning and there's no current. I swam an hour before the tide turned and a, a friend <laughs> kindly came with me. We went without life jackets or boats or anything like that because that would have been cheating. You, there has to be a risk you die or, or it isn't real. Um, and we were swept a mile <laughs> upstream by the Thames. We were in there for about half an hour, I think, before we 
shivering rather, came out. We swallowed quite a lot of that river. You got some criticism for that. Uh, was that fair criticism? Oh, completely fair. Yeah, I mean, the harbour master, who's responsible for the security of the River Thames, had to write to my newspaper, and he did, saying this is a dangerous and irresponsible thing to do. Don't try it at home. And indeed, I said the same in my column. No, that, that, that was his job, but I'm pleased I did it and I'd do it again. If you're looking at Great Britain from the United States, um, and can't figure out what's really going on with all the cuts, and you refer to cutbacks here as just plain cuts. Can you explain to us how severe the economic cutbacks are here? They have not yet bitten, but they're going to bite, and people are increasingly able to see where they're going to bite. To, to, to explain how severe the cuts will need to be, one has to give an impression, first, of the bloatedness and profligacy of British government uh, over the last 10 years or so. We have almost doubled our expenditure on our health care, on our national health uh, service. Nobody doubts that the service has got better, but it hasn't got twice as good. We've gone up from about 4% of our gross domestic product to uh, something like 8% of our, our GDP. I think you Americans are closer to the 10%, and that's with private health care. But we, we've virtually doubled it everywhere you go. Uh, schools, school building, welfare, claims for benefit, which is to say the way the state helps you uh, when you're unemployed, have soared. Uh, incapacity benefit, which is where you say that you're unable to work due to backache or whatever it may be. Well, it may be serious, but it may not. And the non-serious, the malingering claims, I, I think, have grown. Uh, things have, have increased, expenditures have increased not by 5, 10, 15 percent, but by 40, 50, 60 percent, to the extent that our, uh, uh, the proportion of our wealth that is now being spent by the state has climbed from around the 40s to around the 50 percent. We, we can't carry on like this. And the, these things have got to be cut. Go to the uh, health care for a moment. If you live here... How much of your check do you pay to healthcare every month? I don't know, and we don't know because nobody tells you. It, it comes out of general taxation. Uh, it's, it's part of the, the, the Treasury's uh, general coffers, raised through taxation and doled out according to the whims of ministers and the, the, um, the most energetic shroud waving by the medical profession. Well, let me then ask you about the taxes. As a taxpayer, where do you start with that? I mean, we hear about this thing called VAT. Yeah. And we don't have it. We have a sales tax. It's the same thing, basically. Except the sales tax, in most cases, doesn't go above 10%. Yeah. Once in a great while, it does in some states. But uh, there's no national sales tax. Um, explain the VAT. Well, we, of course, don't have a state's system in the way that you do. And so we don't really have smaller units of government within the overall state that are, are, are capable of organizing their own budgets and their own tax raising system and they, they raise charges of various kinds but almost all the expenditure is raised by the state by the central state and spent by the central state and value added tax is really it's just it's just a mega sales tax it's a slightly more complicated system it is um, value added uh, so that e each individual along the chain from the production of an item to the final sale of an item pays tax on the proportion of value that has been added while it's been in their hands. But from the point of view of the ordinary citizen, all you know is that prices, uh, when quoted, you add 17.5% to them, although most retailers would add that, that automatically. And now that's going up to 20% um, very soon indeed. So 20% of everything you buy basically is going to have, I mean, uh, everything every except buy is going to have a 20% tax on Everything it. except food. Um, children's clothing, uh, newspapers, magazines, uh, charities. There are a few exempted items, but about 90% of what we buy. Do you have a property tax that you pay? Not really. We pay a tax on uh, tran transfers of property. So whenever you transfer a property, uh, you pay a proportion of that. That's in the lower percentages as a tax. We also uh, we have what are called domestic rates. Well, now, it's now called the council tax. It used to be called domestic rates. This is for your local authority, your town hall or whatever, and uh, you, you pay a tax according to the value, very approximately according to the value of your property. But all these taxes are very small beer 
compared with VAT and income tax, which are the big ones? Well, go, go to the, uh, the council tax. What percentage of your income would you pay or what percentage of your property value would you pay a year? Well, let me see. Um, I think I pay about £1,500 a year. I have a high valued property, about one thousand. That's something like $2,500. That's about $2,500 on a property that is worth perhaps $2 million, something like that. So it's, it's, it's not enormous. In the United States, you'd pay anywhere from, I don't know, $15,000 and yeah. above for something like that. At yes, least. yeah. So of what other kinds of tax do you have? And how much of this is going to go up besides your VAT tax? Well, the, the, the other really big ones are... Uh, are excise taxes, and that is primarily on tobacco, alcohol, and fuel. Uh, we pay a huge amount on, uh, of tax on, on fuel. I think more than half the cost of a, a gallon or a litre of, of fuel is, is now the tax. Now, but a litre is, what is there, three or four litres to a gallon? Yes, yeah. And, and, and how much is a litre of gas here? It's more than two pounds, more than, more than three or... Nearly four dollars, I would say, a litre, something like that. Just for a litre. I mean, our gas will. Yeah. I, I think the last thing I saw was about three dollars a gallon. Yes. Yeah. So yours is three to four times more expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the government raises a huge amount of revenue on fuel taxes. It raises a huge amount of revenue also on alcohol taxes, where the greater part of a cost of a bottle of wine is the excise duty. Now that is causing and tobacco too. Th those two last are causing difficulties for the government because on the other side of the English Channel in the European Union, they don't pay anything like that amount of tax on alcohol or tobacco, as a result of which, because we're all in a customs union together, people are just getting onto the ferries, crossing the channel with trucks and coming back uh, loaded with, with uh, beer and cigarettes. And so the exchequer is being derived of, deprived of quite a lot of revenue. So there's a sort of um, automatic... Um, balancing, levelling, uh, equalising of taxation going on across the European Union, caused for simply by the fact that if one country charges a hell of a lot more tax for anything than another, people will go to the other country to get it. In January, we'll have a Republican House of Representatives and a, a Democratic uh, Senate and a Democrat in the White House. Here, explain the difference. The David Cameron House, is the Prime the Minister time, and he has proposed all these cuts. Will you automatically get these cuts? And in the United States, you're not, you're not sure until uh, the Congress passes. Pretty automatically. I think a mistake a lot of British people who follow British politics make is to think that they're broadly comparable, the British and the American system, and that <coughs> your president is, um, is like our prime minister, and that uh, you have two houses of your parliament and we have two of ours. Well, no, our prime minister has much more power uh, than your president. He has complete power over the lower house, the House of Commons, and the upper house, the House of Lords, has very limited powers. It, can, it has no powers over anything that costs money or raises money at all. It has no, no, no powers in the revenue department. And even its powers in the rest of legislation are only the power to delay. It can see, keep sending bills back that it doesn't like until a year has passed, and then the Parliament Act can be uh, uh, invoked and the thing goes through anyway. Our House of Lords is not democratically elected, it's appointed, there are plans to reform that, whether they're going to come about or not, nobody knows. But um, it has no real democratic legitimacy, it has expertise. So it, it has not been set up to be, so to speak, in opposition to the House of Commons. It often looks to us British, looking across at your system, as though you have set up two arms of government almost to oppose each other and, and, and to, to, to slow the possibilities of making any big change fast. Well, if our president selects the Treasury Secretary, uh, he has to go or she goes before Congress and has to be approved. Here, it, who decided that George Osborne is going to be the Chancellor of the Exchequer? The Prime Minister. The Prime By Minister. Himself. Entirely his own decision. Entirely. I, I, as a matter of fact, it was a reasonably popular decision, but it wouldn't have mattered whether the whole of the rest of the Conservative Party and the Cabinet and the nation were against it. The Prime Minister appoints uh, his, his Cabinet. You have a coalition government here for the first time since when? Though th there was a coalition government in the 1930s of a kind. And of course, during the Second World War, we had a coalition government. And 
during the 1970s, we had an informal working arrangement between the Liberal Party and the Labour Party. But almost all those previous coalitions have been weak-kneed things where a government that was in trouble uh, was needing to be propped up by another party or to get, a, get us through an emergency like the Second World War. What I think nobody alive in Britain today has any real experience of is a, a, a willing coalition between two quite strong parties um, who, when joined together, when their forces are joined, uh, are, are, are in a fairly impregnable, impregnable position and who more or less agree with each other on the main areas of policy. This is a sort of healthy uh, coalition that has within itself the seeds not only of being able to carry on for five years, but perhaps to carry on the other side of a general election. And that is, that's new to us in Britain. It's very common on the continent, but not here. So I'm a member of the Conservative Party. I stand for what? Can you delineate between the Conservatives or if I'm a Liberal, I stand for what? Liberal Democrat or if I'm a Labour Party member? If you were to draw a continuous spectrum from what you might call the left uh, to, to, to the right, the Conservative Party tends to occupy the right-hand third of that spectrum, although there are wild extremists over to the right who are not in the Conservative Party. The Labour Party tends to occupy the left-hand third. But to say that the Liberal Party is in, in the middle third would be wrong because there are a great many Liberal MPs who are to the right of some Conservative MPs. And there are some Liberal MPs to the left of some Labour MPs. The Liberal Party, you see, is Liberal in the old sense of the word, not the way you use the word in America. You tend to mean left-wing by Liberal um, in the United States. We don't. Uh, liberal means a belief in individual freedom, a belief in individual liberty. Would and that it, be like a libertarian? Now you could be a libert there are plenty of libertarians in the Liberal Party. There are high-tax liberals, but there are low-tax liberals as well. It's the belief in freedom, the belief in individual liberty well, that distinguishes the Let me the test party. it this way. Let's say that you have the Iraq War or the Afghan War. If you're a conservative, what's your position? <laughs> if you're a conservative, your position is ranges from being against the war all along, as uh, both of them, as I was, uh, to being uh, really enthusiastically in favour of them, to, and this would be the characterization I think, of most Conservatives, to the feeling that, that these were rather difficult uh, foreign policy adventures, military adventures, where we had a duty to support the United States, even if we had some doubts uh, ab ab about the adventure. Well, Liberals are almost all against, the, the Liberal Democrat Party are almost all against both wars. Now, we saw Tony Blair for years here as the head of the Labour Party and as the Prime Minister. What's the Labour Party's position on the Afghan war? It's confused. Uh, they got themselves in government into the same position as the Conservative Party, supporting the Americans. Tony Blair tended to support the Americans as though he really thought it was sure it was the right thing to do, and he'd have wanted to do it even if he was on his own, if he'd only had the, the troops. The rest of the Labour Party were not persuaded of that. Most of them took the view that Britain, as a, a, an ancient partner of the United States, has to support the United States, but they weren't enthusiastic about the adventure. Let's go to the VAT tax for a minute. If you're a Conservative member of Parliament, where do you stand on the VAT tax? Do you want to increase it from 17 and a half to 20? Yeah, on the whole, the, the, the fiscal Conservative anyway is in favour of uh, VAT, VAT. It, it is actually a regressive form of taxation in that it hits the poor and the rich almost as, as hard. And uh, Tories on the whole don't like capital gains taxes because they, they, they're a business-minded party. They're not all that keen on income tax because they represent a lot of people who pay a lot of income tax. Value-added tax is seen as a, a very reliable way of raising a large amount of revenue without hitting at what Margaret Thatcher would have called our people. What about the Liberal Party members? Are they for the VAT tax? They, they've been for and against it at different times. Uh, there is no clear Liberal Democrat position on that. What about that. the Labour Party? Well, anybody that either is in government, has been in government or wants to be in government, has to have a sneaking regard for the VAT tax because it's such an easy way of raising money and it's very difficult tax, uh, tax to avoid. So if you live here, when are all these new cuts going to come along and when they do come along, what are we going to see change if you live here? Generally speaking, 
what we're going to see is new money not being allocated to people who are expecting it or think they want it. And so the cuts will bite with progressive uh, ferocity, not, not immediately. We're not going to see, I don't think, the cancellation of a great many huge government projects. And the government is trying to keep infrastructure reasonably preserved from the cuts. What we're going to see in the health service, where we've said, the, the coalition has said that there's going to be uh, no, uh, no cuts to the health service, but the truth is the health service expenditure will be kept constant in real terms. But internal inflation within any health system is always higher than uh, retail price in inflation nationally. So the, the health service is going to be crimped, new hospitals won't be built, waiting lists may get a little bit longer. Education, which is also supposed to have been protected, but already a big new schools building programme, repairing existing infrastructure with schools and building new ones, has had to be cancelled. The biggest one will be local government, that is to say all the town halls and the county councils right across the country. They rely for most of their income not on the council tax on which we were talking a little while ago, but, but on a direct grant from central government. This grant's going to be considerably diminished. They're going to have to lose a lot of their staff, which they'll do mostly through natural wastage. So again, you're going to see a slow but increasingly severe pinch. Well, we read that 500,000, that, that, yeah. that figure is huge because this is a country of 60 million people. Yeah. We're a country of 310 million people, but 500,000 public jobs are going to be eliminated? Yes, but uh, it's important to point out that that doesn't mean that half a million people are going to be sacked tomorrow. It means that over a space of about four or five years, the payroll will be reduced by half a million, which will, in almost every case, be done simply by not hiring new people when old people retire. But there will be cases where people actually have to be made redundant. And the, the, the hope, the coalition's hope, is that the private sector will take up the slack um, it, may, it may be um, an optimistic hope. Who knows? Here's a paragraph from a column you wrote. Again, this is the, the column I read a little bit from earlier in 2005. You, says, you say, it was at Miami Airport on August 17, 2004, as I stood musing for two hours in the aliens' queue for fingerprints. What's the better way of saying that for common language, aliens' <coughs> queue for fingerprints? <laughs> what does that mean? Where were you? I, well, I was traveling like a lot of people from Europe to South America. And there are not as many direct flights as there should be, so the common way to go is using one of the American airlines to Miami, and then changing at Miami. And I understand the situation has improved now, so I must not um, traduce the Miami Airport Authority, but every time I've tried to use that airport, it's been extremely difficult. You see, most airports across the world, if you're in transit, you never go through customs. You never go through immigration. You wait in a transit lounge, get on to the next plane. Miami, you have to go through the whole thing uh, so that you have to formally enter the United States and then a half an hour later leave the United States again. The queues used to be horrendous. And also, and this is something that Europeans do often notice, on the whole, the American service culture is admired in Europe as, as, as being a culture where the customer is, is well treated, people say have a nice day, they smile at you, they ask you if you'd like another Coca-Cola or what, whatever. But when we come to dealing with US officialdom, a very different, much more Russian kind of culture appears to uh, apply. Uh, people are quite severe, quite rude uh, to the public, quite bossy. The insolence of office does seem to creep into US officialdom in a way that it doesn't into your consumer culture, which is held up to the world as an example of good customer service. Where do, can you give me an example of where you see the public officials being rude to the American people? Well, a, a, a woman whom I was traveling with waited in line for, I reckon, about three quarters of an hour. That was the waiting time in order to step over a red line, walk up to a desk and have the little interview with the immigration officer. She what, jumped the gun and moved forward across the line uh, before it was her turn, thus standing in the prohibited zone between the line and the, uh, and the officer's desk. The officer, another woman, shouted at her uh, to get back and then told her to go to the back of the queue and start again. 
as a punishment for having stepped over the line. You would never get that in Britain. You, 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 you don't get officials sort of handing out summary justice in punishments to people in queues. Another subject. What's happening with television here and the BBC? Uh, one of the things that seems to be underway is the BBC moving from London up to Manchester. Yeah. And that's costing a billion dollars and maybe more than a billion dollars, but building new buildings and all that. And then you hear about firings coming along, cuts being in the BBC, changes in who pays for the World Service. Bring us up to date on that. Well, the process of, of trying to devolve the BBC from too heavy a concentration on London has been going on for about 40 years. This, this is one of the boldest moves, but it's, it's part of a, a, a philosophy that the corporation has adopted almost from the start, that if it is to be the British Broadcasting Corporation, it shouldn't be the London Broadcasting Corporation. And so I, I present a programme on Radio 4, which is presented from Brit or, or rather it is produced from Bristol, so that it can go down on the corporation's books as a Bristol where production. Is, where Bristol is Bristol? is about um, 150, 200 kilometres to the west of London. The, the truth is, I, I never go to Bristol. Uh, my guests uh, mostly come to London. I interview them in London, but it's produced in Bristol, in that, so it, it um, fulfills the quota. The move to Manchester is a really bold attempt to, to get quite a lot of the London part of the BBC out and into Manchester. Unfortunately, and there are good arguments to be made for, for, for doing this, if you're going to have a state broadcasting corporation, let it, let it spread itself widely around the state. It's come at a time when the BBC is under severe pressure. They're not going to be able to increase uh, the licence fee. We, we pay for our state broadcasting through a, a, a television licence. How, mu how much does the average Brit pay for... Uh, the television license a year. Do you know? I've forgotten the exact figure, but it's 150 to 200 pounds. So you're a year, talking like somewhere that. around 250 to 275 dollars. Yeah, yeah, at, at least. I think it's slightly more than that. Uh, that, that now, and uh, you know, for the poorer people in the population, it, uh, it bites, and they, they send. They say they send detector vans round to detect at each household whether there is a television operating there for which a license hasn't been paid. So the BBC are under a lot of pressure financially. They're also under a lot of what you might call political pressure because salaries at the top of the corporation have gone completely crazy. The director general, I think, gets nearly half a million pounds, which is, you know, something approaching uh, two million dollars, you know, three quarters of a million dollars uh, a year. Uh, and the corporation appears to be hiring according to pay scales that don't apply in the private sector. There have been examples of, um, of signings uh, contracts that, that appear to be absolutely lunar um, in, 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 in their financial reach. Can so, get, I mean, how about your on-air people? I mean, in the United States, I, people, uh, one of our anchor people on one of the networks makes $15 million a year. Is there anything like that in the BBC? Uh, not quite like that, but uh, you know, that, that there could be people that would be earning more than a million, more than $2 million a year. If you're a big name, Jonathan Ross is one of our big names. There was a lot of fuss about how much he was being paid. If you're a big name, you, you do really well in the BBC. The rest of the corporation are not particularly well paid. So th there's been this fuss, which is as much a moral as a financial fuss, about just how um, engorged the, po the corporation has become close to the top, which has unfortunately coincided with a, a squeeze on the co corporation's uh, revenues and this extremely ambitious and expensive plan to devolve the corporation. I, all I can say is I, I wouldn't like to be Director General of the BBC. Well, I read that several people quit the BBC when they announced the move. I guess the move's been known for a couple of years, but they announced the move to Manchester. Uh, one of the sports announcers and some others just quit. The, 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 some of the breakfast people uh, on the breakfast show don't want to live in Manchester and don't want to do it there. Uh, how extensive is that? That would be very extensive. It is very extensive. Some people are going to move. Some people are going to commute by train, and that, that's no, no picnic How long either. does it take, by the way, to get to Manchester? To Manchester, about two and a quarter hours by, by train, a tilting train that tilts when it goes round the, the corners. No, you see, <clears throat> perhaps to an American audience, it, it, one, one needs to explain, because you have so much larger a country with so many different centres, commercial, cultural, and all the rest, you don't have one huge centre of gravity. This is a mistake a lot of British people make about America. They think that New York 
is to the United States as London is to the United Kingdom. Uh, not so, because all mo I'm, I'd get into trouble if this was being broadcast in the United Kingdom, but a lot of the talent that there is um, culturally, uh, socially, in every way in Britain gravitates uh, to London. Almost every big corporation would feel the need to have its headquarters in London. The civil service is in London. The legislature is in London. We're not a very big country and we are a hugely centralised country. And so for, for, for the better part of a century, it has been the, the aim, the labour of governments to try to devolve uh, power, uh, talent uh, across the regions. But you're kind of kicking against gravity all the time. For years, the BBC World Service, which can be heard all across the United States, was funded by the Foreign Office here in Great Britain. And under the cuts plan, I understand that it's supposed to be funded by the BBC itself. Is that true? And what impact will that have on the World Service? Nobody knows. I'm old enough to remember when the World Service was funded by the BBC and the government of the day decided that it would be funded by the Foreign Office instead. And everybody said this is going to be a disaster for the World Service. It's just going to become uh, an arm of British foreign policy and they're going to starve it of, of money and, and try to direct its operations. That didn't happen. The World Service is always kept on a very tight financial leash, but it is prospered uh, under the wing of the, B, the, uh, of the, of the Foreign Office. I, I don't see why it shouldn't prosper under the wing of the BBC, especially as the BBC these days has a much bigger global reach, not, not in terms of the World Service, but in terms of the corporation's other activities, uh, BBC World, the television service, its marketing, its books, its videos, all the rest. So I think, I think, that, I think the BBC is perfectly conscious of the importance of the world and the world market, and I think the World Service is safe. How independent is the as BBC and the fact that it gets its money from the government? Has that worked over the years, in your opinion? Well, if I was... Um, if I was arguing before an American audience, which I, I am, I would say it's absolutely extraordinary how independent the BBC is. Don't think that this is just a state broadcasting corporation like the Russian uh, one, or to, to some degree uh, ra ra Radio Liberty. That, 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 that. It's not. It really is independent. It does what it likes. It often falls out of favour with government. It criticises government all the time. If I'm arguing with a British audience, we tend to be a little smug about the BBC and say, oh, our BBC is fantastic, completely independent. I would, I would argue that, yes, it's got a pretty good degree of independence, but if you are the state broadcasting corporation, you damn well are the state broadcasting corporation. You know that you are. There are things you don't do. There are things you don't say. There are programmes you, you, you don't make. There's a sense of propriety about the corporation which doesn't apply to the uh, leaner hungrier and sometimes more disgraceful rivals that the BBC competes with. So yes, it's pretty independent, but no, it's not. It'll never be. He who pays the piper in the end calls the tune. You are a conservative member of parliament. Are you still a conservative? And more importantly, what would you define your politics to be today? And give us a couple of examples of what you feel the strongest about. I'm, I'm, I'm still completely and deeply uh, a conservative. I I've, was a it's rather unhealthy, this. I was a conservative as a student, as an undergraduate, and I've never wavered. Um, I'm a conservative partly because I agree with many of the aims of the Conservative Party and partly because I hate socialism. I hate collectivism, and I saw what a creeping collectivism was beginning to do to the United Kingdom, and any party that's going to resist uh, the collective uh, approach to, to human culture and an economy is, is, uh, is, is going to be my party. I like what's happening to the Conservative Party. I've always been a bit of a liberal uh, conservative. Uh, I, I, I've always believed in a degree of state welfare and compassion for the poor and all the rest. And I've always believed in individual liberty, which some on the right are a little bit cherry about, except when the liberties coincide with their own tastes. Um, so I like the coalition between the Conservative Party and the Liberal Democrats. I think it has a civilizing influence on the Conservative Party. And I think it has a sort of educating and growing up a bit influence on the Liberal Democrats. Now they have to think where the money is going to come from. I believe very strongly that the role and strength and effectively the, 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 the potential for chilling 
and stultifying a culture of the state depends on how much money it has to spend and how much money it's getting from the taxpayer. The battle to push back the frontiers of the state and the battle to push back the amount of money that the state is claiming from the individual, I think is the absolutely central battle for Britain in the first half of the 21st century. And I believe that the coalition is, is, is on the right side in that battle. So I often say we when I ought to say they. Have you ever totaled up the percentage of your income a year that goes to tax? Yes, I have not made a careful calculation. I'm in that happy category of not needing to, but um, it's something approaching 60% of my income. When you take, it might be more like 70 if you took the VAT, the sales tax, the excise duties, the income tax, uh, the capital gains tax, and we have another one that we haven't even mentioned, you and I, called national insurance, which is supposed to be payment towards the welfare state, the pension system. It's actually just become an adjunct to income tax now, but um, that one too. So yes, I, I reckon that for every hundred pounds that I earn, uh, I would be lucky if I get to spend more than 40, and it might well be less than that. How do people here make it on, with that kind of tax? Well, I suppose incomes um, are a little higher because they aren't worth as much after tax. But the people who really get pinched, I think, are not the people right at the bottom who pay little tax, nor the people fairly near the top, as I am lucky enough to be. The lower middle classes in, in particular, and the middle middle classes, you know, trying to survive on a, a household, perhaps, on a joint income of about £40,000, which is way above the national uh, average. It would uh, be $65,000. $65,000, and paying perhaps $30,000 of that back in various taxes. It's, it's not easy. But, but if you get sick, you can walk into any hospital and get treated? That's true. And of course, we have free state education, as you have in the United States. So you won't pay for your health care. Uh, you, you won't pay for your education, but for everything else you pay. I want to come back to education, but you have been for years openly gay and a member of the conservative wing of politics in this, in this country. If yeah. you're in the United States, that might not be easy. Why have you been so uh, open about it? It might not be easy. On the other hand, you could find a range of um, people on the right in, in America uh, to, to basically to give exactly the same story as I, I'm giving, which is that to, to believe um, in homosexual law reform, uh, uh, to believe that, that gay people are, are uh, equal citizens, and, and to believe that uh, relationships between people of the same sex are not necessarily antisocial, dangerous, or personally damaging is not inconsistent. Uh, with being a conservative, with being a fiscal conservative, with believing in, the, uh, in, in a small state, indeed with believing that the state shouldn't trample over too much over people's private lives, and believing in individual freedom of conscience, freedom of speech. These are all things that a conservative ought to be able to support. I mean, I know Andrew Sullivan is only an honorary American, but talk to Andrew Sullivan in the, in the United States and you'll get the same story from him as you will from me and, and, and millions of other conservatives. How long have you been with this partner? I've been with my partner, well, we, we've met and grew closer about 15 years ago. We got a civil partnership ceremony uh, about five years, four years ago, when those things became available. Recently, in some of your columns, it, ageism has creeped in. You've been admitting to getting older, and uh, what do you think of that? I don't like age. Uh, you know, there's a lot of... Um, a lot of old gentlemen go around saying, oh, you know, it's, it's, you're as young as you feel. I'm, I'm not afraid of old age. I'm not afraid of old age, uh, but I don't like old age. Uh, I'm not afraid of the end of the summer holidays, but I don't like the approach of the end of the summer holidays. I'm not afraid of death, not at all afraid of death, and I, I'm not afraid of pain, but I don't want to die. I love life, and I just want it to go on forever, and I want to be strong forever. I want to be mentally sharp forever, and the fact is, it happens to all of us at slightly different ages. It's plainly not happening uh, to you, but it is to me. I know I'm not as sharp in my own brain as I used to be. I, I find myself sometimes struggling to keep up with very quick fire uh, conversations. I need things explaining to me more carefully than I used to. I forget words, phrases, as everybody does. Uh, I, I can see that we are all degenerating all through our lives, probably from the age of about 18, but it does begin to accelerate 
after 60. And I don't like it. I, I really don't like it. But your partner is, what, considerably younger than you? Yeah, he's about 20 years younger than me. So, um, <laughs> well, I, I, I think actually one has a, not just in civil partnerships, but in marriage too, one has a, one has a, a civic responsibility to marry someone very much younger than oneself. Then after one goes, they can have another partner and another life all over again. Does the cruel thing is to marry someone 10 years younger than yourself. It'll be too late when you go for them to start again. Now, does he still work for The Guardian? He does, yes. Now, The Guardian yeah. is not, well, it's a liberal pa or, or a labor paper, isn't it? Yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't admit to being a labor pa paper, but it does seem to have reverted uh, to a sort of fairly knee-jerk support for the, the does labor Does he write? Party. Yeah, um, he writes the occasional editorial, but of course when you write editorials you just write according to the paper's policies. And um, he, he writes a column in which he, he uh, raises the standard uh, for the coalition. He's one of the few Guardian columnists who, who supports the coalition. Now, why would he support the coalition and work for the Guardian? He used to be a Liberal Democrat. Um, I don't think he belongs to any party now. He's moving rather to the right of me in his own opinions, uh, but that doesn't stop you working. The Guardian is a paper that uh, respects diversity of opinion. In some ways, it's rather more fun to be out of um, kilter with the majority view on your, your newspaper. The Guardian needs voices that understand, are sympathetic to, and will explain the coalition, and Julian is one of them. We mentioned earlier, the, or you did, the education, and you say that you don't pay for education here. I heard on the radio the other day, and I... Is, not too far from here where they had the demonstrations of the students. I guess it's right across the river. Mm. Uh, demonstrating against the government's idea of, of increasing the cost of education. If you go to a college, now one of the hard things we've always had uh, trouble understanding is private education here is public and public education is private? Yes, yes, yeah. Explain. Uh, like, like, like that good old word liberal, we, we have endless confusions um, o over the, this, um, this use of language. Um, a public school in Britain, no time for a long history lesson, but <clears throat> in the old days, on the whole, um, rich people would have their chil children educated by a, a, a governor or a, a tutor. And then uh, quite a lot of quite rich people and quite a lot of middle class people decided to set up schools where you paid for the school. And they were called public schools because kids from the public all went to the schools. The fact that they were paid uh, didn't make them... Uh, not public schools. Then much later, in the 19th century, towards the end of the 19th century, free state education was set up. So we've ended up with schools called public schools that are actually private, and state schools which are, uh, which are free. So explain this. I heard a, a, a young lady on the radio here <coughs> talking to a liberal Democrat who's a member of the coalition, and she was so unhappy, she kept saying, you lied to me. I voted for you because you said you would not cut our, uh, our cost of public education. And you now have agreed in the coalition to up the cost of education. Explain why she is so upset. The issue to which you refer is the question of tuition fees. Now, uh, you Americans w will not find anything remotely surprising in the idea that a university might charge um, its students a fee for the course at the university. But we haven't had that uh, in the past in Britain. It's all been paid for uh, by the government. And then the last government, the Labour government, having promised that they wouldn't introduce tuition fees, did, but limited them to £3,000 or you know, $4,500 or so a year and brought in a system of loans uh, where students could get a loan from the government if they didn't have the money to pay their fees, and the loan would be payable back at, a, I think, a zero rate of interest over a very long period. So it was the thin end of the wedge. And what this government uh, are now doing is raising the ceiling, I think, to uh, £15,000, $25,000 or more uh, that, that uh, universities can charge for tuition fees, and slightly changing the loans system so that the richer you become after you've left university. In other words, the more you can turn your degree into money, uh, the, the more you pay back uh, and the faster you pay back in, in interest. Now, the Liberal Democrats, because they're a party that does very well amongst students and does very well in university towns, have always set their face against this. And they were unwise enough. And uh, their leader, Nick Clegg, uh, now our Deputy Prime Minister, uh, he realised he now says even at the time it was a mistake they were unwise enough to get all their parliamentary candidates to sign a pledge 
uh, saying that uh, Liberal Democrats would never raise tuition fees. And now they're part of a coalition that has raised tuition fees, hence the anger. How many members of the Conservative uh, Party are in Parliament? There were 650-some uh, members? Yeah, uh, I, I, I can't remember the exact arithmetic. It, w it will be 300 and something. It gives the Conservative Party something just short of a majority. So that would be about uh, 350, 340, something like that. And then the Liberal Democrats add another 80 or so to that and, and give them a, an overall majority. We're about out of time, and I want to make sure that we get this on the record. If someone wants to read the body of information you've written over the years, what's the easiest way to get it? Well, I've, um, I've just d developed um, an archive of all my work, but I, I'm exploring whether I can put it online. I probably can't because a lot of it is copyrighted to the Times newspaper. Much of my, the great body of uh, my writing, if anyone should be so foolish as to want to read it, has been in the Times newspaper, the Times of London, that is, and the Spectator magazine. Both of them have websites. Uh, I think you have to pay for access with the Spectator. I know you have to with the Times. But there are other better reasons uh, for, for uh, scaling the paywall of News International. But I believe you can buy a day on the Times so that you, could, you could go in there and you find can. most of your stuff. Yeah, I, I write a weekly diary which appears on the Thursday and I write a, a, a mega column every, for every Saturday. Last uh, question or so. Um, w what do you think is in store for this country over the next five to ten years? I slightly misinformed you a moment ago when I said the number of Conservatives, which is closer to about 318, 320. So they don't have a majority. So the first question is, can the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrat coalition, can it hold together until the next general election, which they say they want to have in 2015. I think, I think it can. I think politically, the chemistry, the arithmetic is, is all there. So I don't think you're going to see a weak or tottering government. Nevertheless, everything depends on the economy. And in the end, this coalition and the happiness of the coalition depends on the economy. If the economy goes fat, the Liberal Democrats will feel that they, they've been drawn into a most uh, unfortunate experiment in government. If the economy crashes, then whoever is the opposition, whatever is the opposition, will win the next election. If the economy goes well, people will thank the coalition for making the cuts, making us leaner and healthier again, and they'll, they'll cruise back to an easy victory at the next election. What's your guess about the future? Are you optimistic, pessimistic? I'm guardedly optimistic. I, I, Unless the world economy crashes, in which case we'll all be dragged down by it, I think the British economy is in fairly good hands. I expect to see low growth, but growth for the next uh, three or four years. I expect to see the cuts not hurting quite as much as everybody thought. And I expect people to feel in four years' time that uh, these were changes that had to be made and that we approach the next decade perhaps uh, fitter and in more fighting condition than we approach the first. Matthew Paris, Times of London, thank you very much. We're out of time. It's been a pleasure. For a DVD copy of this program, call 1-877-662-7726. For free transcripts, or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qna.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts. The Redesigned Book Notes website now